Uh, so we're really, really lucky today to be joined by John Walters, the full uh, naturalist uh, on Dartmoor, and he will uh, tell us a little bit more about the ecology of the brown beetle. Thanks very much, Andy. Um, hope everyone can hear me. Um, I can't see you, but uh, I'm sure you can see me. And uh, for the next half hour, I'm going to talk to you about the uh, one of my favourite insects, the blue ground beetle. It's a bit of a monster, uh, very rare. I like to explore the natural world through drawing and painting in the field, and I've done this for many years. And uh, in recent uh, years, also uh, with the advent of uh, digital cameras, I've been able to use digital cameras to record uh, photographs and videos as well. Uh, this is me actually out on the uh, on that very hot day last week. I was in Hampshire, and uh, I was uh, my parent. I grew up on Haining Island in Hampshire, and I come off the island, but I couldn't actually get back on because uh, there were so many people trying to get to the beach um, that I couldn't actually get on. So I went to this place called Bosom on the the little cruise, and I was afternoon sketching some. From out in the field, so from life. It's quite a big beetle, but it's the largest ground beetle, so it's about three centimeters long and a bit more with the legs and antenna. You can see it's a beautiful blue color. Uh, its uh, scientific name is Carabus intricatus, and I think that's due to these intricate uh, markings and, and ridges and sculpturing on the wing cases in the rest of the body. A very, very beautiful beetle. It's quite restricted globally, so it's found in Europe. Uh, there's just a few sites in southwest England, one in Wales, I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, otherwise, its uh, main, main populations are thought to be in France, and there are scattered populations right the way from southern Sweden, uh, east to Belarus, and down to Greece. So it's a, a fairly restricted world range for this beetle. Uh, obviously, the beetle, it can't fly, so it uh, must have walked here after the last ice age, and sometime in the last sort of, uh, thousand years, uh, it's actually walked across from where it would have been in a refugia during the glaciations down in south southern uh, France somewhere, and then it, as the forest moved north, the glaciers retreated, uh, then the beetle would have moved north with those, uh, and uh, it's ended up in a few sites just in southwest England. So these are the known sites. There's about the sites uh, around Dartmoor, Bodmin Moor, and one site in South Wales near Neath. The blue ground beetle is uh, part of a family of uh, beetles called Carabus. There are a number of these uh, occur in Britain. Uh, some of them are reasonably common. Uh, they're all mainly nocturnal, so you don't tend to see them, but occasionally they do wander out during the daytime. Uh, this, is what, this is a blue ground beetle on the left with the uh, one of the violet ground beetles on the right, which is the things which are most similar to it. But once seen, the blue ground beetle is unmistakable. It has a very uh, narrow thorax, very long spidery legs, and uh, some unusual habits, which we'll see in a minute. These are some of its close relatives. So going round, uh, we have the uh, Amaralis, a ground beetle, and then one there's two beetles, uh, the problematicus, the common beetle at the bottom left. Uh, the problematicus is the common violet ground beetle which you find on Dartmoor. You do find uh, the violet ground beetle, but it's not so common as, as problematicus. And down in the bottom right is the blue ground beetle, uh, much, much bluer all over the body and with those ridges and sculpturing you can see on the sides. I produced a guide to uh, ground beetles, so this is uh, available from my free from my website, and I'll give you the details at the end if you're interested in that. Uh, so this shows all of the British uh, carabus or the larger carabus ground beetles and how you can identify them. They're really amongst the ground beetles, uh, they're the hawk moths of the ground beetles, so they're actually quite reasonably easy to identify uh, compared to a lot of the other ones, which are small and black. This is uh, the oldest specimen of uh, the blue ground beetle I could find, and it actually may even be the first one ever found in Britain. It's uh, in a collection near Reading for the, in the British Entomological and Natural History uh, Society's collection, and it was collected by a guy called Elford Leach in Devon uh, in the 1800s. And it was Leach who first discovered the blue ground beetle in Britain 
just near Tapperstock at the uh, Virtuous Lady Mine. Uh, he found it there in 1811, and then he subsequently found it at, at a few other sites around the edges of Dartmoor, mainly in that part of Dartmoor, the sort of west side. And uh, so this could possibly be that first specimen that he found. Um, it had a, it's always been elusive, this beetle. It's only, as I say, it's only found in the southwest, and it's uh, and it, in Victorian times, when people were mad on collecting beetles, this was one of these sort of ultimate prizes, really, for your collections to find the blue ground beetle. And for many years, actually, uh, it, it, it wasn't seen, and it actually disappeared for a, a little while. And I'll talk a bit about how it was rediscovered in a minute. But these, uh, this is just a, a brief history of the blue ground beetle from that first one that Leach found in 1811. Uh, then there are other records from around Holden. Dawlish Way, Ashburton, so the edges of Dartmoor in the 1800s. And then after that, it was just seen occasionally. So the records from Horrorbridge in the 1930s, Plymouth. There's a dodgy record from Somerset Peat Moors, which probably isn't true. Uh, then it was found on Holden again in the 1960s. Uh, but the site there has now been uh, coniferized, so that this beetle only lives in broadleaf oak and beech woodlands. Um, and then there are a few sites in uh, Cornwall as well. Uh, since uh, in, it was seen in uh, Cornwall in 1972, 1973, and then after that it was actually thought to be extinct uh, until it was discovered at Haunts and Dendleswood near Cornwood in 1985, and uh, then subsequently by Clive Turner, uh, an entomologist uh, living in, on Dartmoor in the 1990s, and he discovered it at Ivy Bridge and again at Haunt and Dentalswood. And since 1994, it's been recorded every year. So it's uh, been known every, it's the first, the, most, the longest series of years, which it's been consecutively found. Uh, and as I said, it's now found at 10 sites. It was so rare a creature that uh, in the 1800s, uh, there was a reward of five pounds given uh, to anyone who could rediscover the beetle by the Zoologist magazine. Um, in the end, uh, you see at the bottom there, uh, Mrs. Haywood uh, was out walking with her husband and uh, found one near Ivy Bridge. Although it was slightly damaged, so they only gave her, I think it was three pounds and a few shillings, which I think she was a bit hard done by uh, to uh, just not receive the full reward. Uh, but there it was. Uh, this is Clive Turner, who uh, discovered the beetle in the 1990s in Horns and Dendles and Ivy Bridge Woods. And it, it was Clive I met when I was working at the National Park at that time uh, as a graphic designer and uh, Clive uh, kindly came into the National Park uh, to show me and Norman Baldock, the ecologist at the time, uh, showed me the blue ground beetle specimens and then uh, I was inspired to actually go out and try and see this beetle myself. So I wandered out into the woods, I live in Buckfast Lee, so I wandered up into the Dark Valley looking in the woodlands there and this is in the 24th of April 1996 and it was about two o'clock in the afternoon I had to remember the exact time uh, when I discovered this beetle in the woods there and I just approached this tree here and peeled back the bark and there was the shimmering blue beetle a uh, really fantastic thing to see and at a, a completely new site uh, in the dark valley as well so doubly exciting to find it and that was really the start of my uh, interest in this beetle and it just carried on ever since. Since that time, I was, uh, Clive was working for uh, Natural England at the time on a project for on the ground, blue ground beetle. Uh, he then moved off abroad, and so our friend Dave Boyce here and myself carried on to the research in the old sites that I could on Holden, uh, where the beetle was seen in the 1960s. So you see one equivalent, uh, but uh, it was replaced by conifers and grass, all trees and grub down. Uh, these are mainly pasture woodlands, may oak, was a bit, uh, and the key theme of these woodlands is the, the, uh, the, 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 the,
in these uh, sites uh, down in Cornwall. These are the sites around Bodmin Moor, uh, which are, again, very similar to the sites on Dartmoor. So this is uh, a beach plantation on Bodmin Moor, and this is surrounded by some ancient woods where the blue ground beetle lives. And the beetle has actually moved into this beach plantation. This is uh, just near Trago Mills, the other Trago Mills down in Cornwall. It's just along the road from there. And this is a, a good place to find a beetle. This is one of the classic sites on, on Dartmoor, on the, in the Dart Valley, and the beetle likes these really mossy woodlands, which are very damp, and um, full of its favourite food, which is slugs. But it, it not only needs it to be damp, it needs it to be warm as well. So this is uh, looking down the Dart Valley, down towards the coast, and it, on the, in all the woodlands on the left there, uh, you get the blue ground beetle, but the woodlands on the right, which which are north facing, uh, it's very rarely seen in there. I've only ever found a handful in the, in, on the right hand side, but I found almost a thousand on the other side, south facing side. So it, it not, it's quite fussy about where it lives, so it needs to be warm and damp as well. It uh, probably lived for years as an adult beetle. Uh, during the winter, they hibernate under bits of mossy covered bark. This one's in a hibernation cell under under some bark, so they are reasonably easy to find at this time of year. And uh, they will stay in this hibernation cell until early spring, usually some, sometime in March they will em emerge and uh, uh, start to be active. Their main breeding season is during the spring. Uh, sometimes I find them hibernating in similar places where you find hibernating queen hornets. But the best way to find the blue ground beetle is to go out at night in the springtime between late March and early July on damp nights and if you're in the right location uh, look on the trees with a torch and you will see the beetles it's actually quite an easy thing to find it's quite a big thing and it does stand out in the torchlight here's a nice uh, male blue ground beetle out at night and here at this time they hunt for slugs there's one just caught a slug and uh, what they do is they follow slug slime trails up trees and when they Hit, grab the slug, they grab onto it with their pincer jaws, and then they inject the contents of, the, of their stomach into the slug, so the digestive juices go into the slug. They quickly kill it, and then, uh, then they, once they kill the slug, then they suck out all the insides. So it's a bit like um, they turn it into slug soup and then suck all the insides of the slug out. So within about half an hour or so, this beetle can eat a slug which is as big as itself. So it's quite an impressive predator. There it is munching away, so this slug is, uh, there's not much left of it now, it's after about 10-15 minutes. And here's a little bit of video, I'll just play you, of uh, a beetle. This was out near Sanford Spiny this, in May this year. This one's just caught a slug and it's just starting to eat it. You can see how it's really gripping on there with its uh, pincer jaws there. Then it's injecting its uh, stomach contents into the slug, pre-digesting it and turning it into slug soup. And so after 20 minutes, half an hour, there's nothing left of the slug at all, but the beetle is able to expand its body. So it has a huge fat body um, uh, so it can accommodate this large meal and that will keep it going for a few days. There it is wandering off. There's uh, another rare beetle which lives in the woods as well, it's particularly uh, in the Dark Valley and Haunts of Dendles Wood, called the Caterpillar Hunting Beetle. This is a relative of the blue ground beetle. It only comes out in May when there's lots of caterpillars around. And it is quite a rare beetle. So it's only found in a, in a few sites in Britain. Uh, not as rare as the blue ground beetle, but a nice one to see uh, at night. Again, it's a, a nocturnal beetle. So it's out with the blue ground beetles at night. And sometimes in the spring, you can see the mating pairs. The female is much larger than the male. And the male will grip onto the female with his uh, front uh, uh, tarsi, which are the pads on the ends of his front legs. This was a strange, this is a, a mating pair with another male who was a bit late on the scene trying to get in on the act. So there's a mating, uh, I think there's a bit of video of this. So this is uh, three blue ground beetles. This is the, you see the big female there, she's obviously just eaten a slug, her body's very fat. But, uh, the, uh, that other male was a bit too late to the scene. This is another one feeding on a slug. They often catch the slugs to start with and wander off with them a little way and then they'll keep hold of them. I think that's why they've got such long legs so they can actually lever themselves while they're actually killing the slug 
uh, could stop it actually getting away. There it is. It's uh, once the slug's been slug's been caught, there's uh, no hope for it really. Now the blue ground beetle uh, has, a, as all beetles do, has a full metamorphosis like a butterfly. Uh, so it starts off as an egg, then turns into this plated larva, then turns into a pupa, and then the adult beetle emerges. And as I said uh, earlier, the adult beetle can probably live for several years. This is the larva. It's a sort of armor plated thing. It also feeds on slugs. Uh, can be identified from the very closely related uh, species by the number of little spikes on its tail. And uh, this is one which is just called to quite a small slug. And again, these things climb up trees at night and hunt for slugs. This is one which I once saw catching the world's largest slug, the ash black slug, which lives on Dartmoor. This is a huge slug which can grow up to 20 or 30 centimetres long. And the blue ground beetle larva actually had followed one of these and uh, started to munch it, which was uh, in 2001 in July. And there's a little bit of old video of it actually doing this. Uh, probably unique this, I don't think anyone's, this is in the wild, I just happened to come across this and usually the beetle's active at night, uh, the larva as well, but this one was out during the daytime, so I was very lucky to actually see this and it's caught this giant slug and uh, trying to kill it. And it did eventually manage to kill the slug and that was all it needed, really, for, to, to complete its development. I actually took it home, and then it um, pupated. And there's the pupa of the blue ground beetle. You can see the great jaws there, and the, uh, the eyes starting to appear, and all the intricate palps and legs. And then after a few weeks as a pupa, uh, for one day only, it's the white ground beetle. Uh, just uh, before it, when it's just emerged, it's white, and then over the course of 24 hours, it uh, fully colors up and becomes blue. Um, and then uh, these are some marked individuals. So as part of the studies I did, I, I tried to try and work out how many beetles there were in some of the woodlands. So I tried various methods of marking them. I put bits of paint or tipex on them, uh, but they, this quickly wore off. I used to keep some in a tank at home just to test how effective these markings were. And that was pretty useless putting the paint on because the beetle burrows through soil and under bark, so it quickly rubs off. Uh, I found the best method, which I use for other beetles as well, is actually to scratch a little marking on the wing cases, uh, and then this is permanent, it doesn't harm the beetle, and then you can uh, you can identify them whenever you find, find them. So I marked a number of uh, ground beetles during the study, um, and I found actually there were quite large numbers of beetles present, and they were quite nomadic in the woodlands. So I remember going out one week at uh, Horns and Dendleswood, and we caught marked 17 beetles, and then we went back the next week in the same area, we caught 34 beetles, but none of them were the marked ones. So uh, there was obviously quite a large population there. It's quite tricky to actually see all the beetles at one time because they can be up in the trees or under the ground. And just the one, you tend to see the ones which are on the tree trunks while you were looking. So just after dusk, the ones which are active on tree trunks. Now, until a few years ago, it was only known from Devon and Cornwall, until uh, a guy in uh, Wales uh, contacted Bug Life, that is Andrew Whitehouse and uh, Duncan from Bug Life, and uh, said he found a blue ground beetle in his garret near Neath. And it was a blue ground beetle, so we went to investigate and found that it, he'd actually found two or three in his garden. And his garden hasn't got any vegetation in it, uh, but there was some, a very good woodland nearby, so we thought the beetles must be coming from there. It did take a few years actually to locate them. And did eventually manage to find them in the wood. Uh, we found the reason that they turned up in this guy's garden was because there was a little stream which washed out of the woodland and when after torrents of water it actually washed a lot of leaf litter and, and things and sticks and things down and obviously carried some beetles with it and there was a drain outside this guy's garage and so all the all the water ran down the drain leaving a big pile of litter and containing the beetles and then the beetles just climbed up the nearest wall and into this guy's garden. So that solved the mystery of how it got there. Uh, and there's there's one actually in the wild, and it's been studied quite extensively now by bug life in Wales. So this is the, the blue ground beetle. As I said, I've seen nearly a thousand of these beetles. They're fascinating. I go out every year, particularly in the springtime, to look for them. Uh, there's always more to learn about them, and I'm sure there's a few more sites out there 
uh, still to discover them. There was uh, new sites have been found around Bodmin Moor, and there are probably uh, a few other sites uh, uh, still to find, maybe around Dartmoor even. Uh, certainly sort of Dartmoor, West Devon, into Cornwall. I imagine there's one or two more sites to find. So a fascinating thing to see. Just finished by showing you a few of the, uh, the media appearances by the Beatles. So this is uh, cameraman filming for the one show. Uh, this is uh, filming out at night. We filmed the blue ground beetle eating a slug. So that was Mark McEwen doing that. And this is uh, actually was on the one show. And I'll show you this. There is a link to it if you want to watch the film later. There's a link to the film on my website, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, I've written a paper for British Wildlife magazine on the conservation of the, ground, uh, the blue ground beetle uh, with Dave Boyce. And that was in uh, 2001, if you want to look that one up. And uh, there's a little bit more information on my website. Uh, I, a lot of the uh, information that's usually on there isn't actually available at the minute. But if you'd like to download the uh, guide, that's uh, available. If you look, just look at the link at the top, you can identify the guide to, uh, I, or uh, obtain the guide to identifying these beetles. And the link to the one show film is uh, on the bottom of that middle column there. Okay, well, thanks very much for listening. and uh, I'll be. Happy to answer questions if you have them. Thank you.